We are very excited because as you have seen, the way we have assembled these uh, four lecture series, each one has a specific objective. I mean, from giving you the big picture to get into some of the uh, rankings for the different countries to the vision from one of the most global uh, companies on earth like Stale Order. And then today uh, we are particularly excited because is the introduction of a software that is uh, widely used when you're dealing with global trade. And we cannot have a better person to introduce those ideas plus the uh, example of the implementation. I know you all got this software and you are waiting for the software. What you were signing was like a um, disclosure form. Now you're going to get the software. All that is going to be explained to you later. But let me just introduce the person that made all this possible. His name is Darren Maynard. He's principal of DPM Consulting. Darren runs a unique consulting model that he describes as a lifestyle business. He advises five CEOs each in unique businesses, and he brings 35 years of experience in technology, sales, and strategy. His CEOs are owners of corporations ranging in revenue from $4 million to $3 billion. In this role, he leverages 13 years with IBM, three years as the CIO of a global freight forwarder, LEP, so he has a direct first-hand experience on how to move things around the world, six years as the COO of a global trade software company, Next Links, and various engagement, engagements advising the investors of early stage technology startups. He is leading the initiative for one of his clients, the one that you're going to be exposed today, Integration Point, who you will hear more from today. So join me in welcoming Darren. Thank you Thank for coming. You. <coughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Is, is the microphone on? Can you all hear me? Great. Uh, so let me start by telling you, I was just calculating it, 38 years ago, and some of you will not believe this, but 38 years ago, I was sitting in your seats in an undergraduate class, uh, listening to a professor talking about a gentleman called Alvin Toffler on a book called Future Shock. Has anybody read that book by any chance? One, maybe? So I can tell you I found it not the least bit interesting. He was talking about social change and how culture, uh, technology was moving really fast, how social interaction would occur. And all that mattered to me at that time was where was I going for a drink that night. And as fate happens, two years ago, <clears throat> the consulting firm he created called Toffer Associates uh, approached me and asked me if I could give them some help uh, on their business. And so out of courtesy, I realized I had to read the book again. And so, what was interesting was some of the things that he predicted. And I honestly would encourage anyone to pick up the book because he wrote it in 1970. It's almost like a Nostradamus moment when you start reading the book and realize how many things that he was aware of that was likely to happen over time. So I wanted to just talk about that and how that, I think, impacts global trade today and going into the future. And then talk about a subject that I teach at Penn State Executive Program. And I take two hours to teach that. But uh, Ricardo told me how smart you guys are. So I'll try and cover that very quickly in 30 minutes. Um, so what Toffler basically said was that we're going through waves of change. And the first wave going back in time was the agricultural revolution. And it took nomads and organized them into small villages. The second major wave of change was the Industrial Revolution. And if you look at how the Industrial Revolution changed us, it wasn't just that we had machines that now automated manufacturing processes or even agriculture, but it was also how it changed the social fabric. Right? And that's what I didn't really get back then, but it really hit home as you start understanding uh, how much has changed. And, and just as a diversion, back in 1970, and none of, most of you weren't even born then, um, People didn't talk about somebody being gay. Toffler in 1970 talked about gay couples having kids. Right? And I can tell you probably why I couldn't get it when I was reading the book. His vision about how our world would be was so advanced. So what Toffler suggests that in the third wave, and what we're living through now, is everything is just going faster and faster. <clears throat> and we're moving from more of a mechanized world to a knowledge-based economy. And, and it seems obvious now, but again, thinking that he wrote this in 1970, 
And he talks about this term demassification and consumerism, basically saying you no longer have like, you know, one black Ford car, but you now have very customized, very specialized products for very small markets and the ability to um, consumers to have a lot more control and choice. And some of the uh, predictions he makes, well, the first was all about new materials. He said, and today I was just watching a program how they're going to use stem cells to create meat straight from the cells themselves. Uh, I mean, some amazing things that are going on with new, new products. The second one is the space industry, and that's kind of the focus of startups today. There's like 10 different companies all racing into turning space uh, into a commercial entity. He talked about the sea and how, and today we take that for granted that there's a lot of, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ocean farming and salmon farming. And then he gives the example of demassification in media. And to give you a perspective, living in England, when I read the book, we only had three TV channels and, and we were just looking forward to getting a fourth. And he was talking about media dramatically changing, where it became very narrow markets and the consumer actually choosing what they wanted to read or listen to. And probably, and then the social memory, this idea of uh, people collecting information and sharing and adding to that information. And remember, you know, most of us didn't have a computer, let alone have access to the internet. And his final piece was really about civilization and how from a, uh, from having been more of a national structure, you are now going to have organizations that panned multiple countries, both uh, commercially, like corporations, but even, uh, amazingly, he talked about terrorism and uh, religion spanning those boundaries. Um, and <clears throat> so I wanted to look at some of the things that are happening in the global trade world, and it's amazing to me, even now, that I, having taught at Penn State for seven years and I teach supply chain professionals, the number of them could tell you anything about a domestic transportation move, but most of them have never dealt with some of the rules and regulations surrounding international. And yet, almost everything, I could almost take any one of you and try and see if you can find what was made in America in what you're wearing, right? So our world today, there's very little that does not cross at least one country boundary, but the level of understanding of what's involved in working with trade is still relatively low. And I would encourage you when you're doing your country projects that you really think about that because there's a lot of people making bad decisions in business because of that lack of understanding. Um, so the first point is the uh, global trade is pandemic. Right? It's, I, I sit on a board of a company that's only about 30 million in revenue and yet all of their products are made in China and Vietnam and they sell into multiple countries. So we're no longer talking large corporations dealing with global issues. You will find even very small startups today are dependent on whether it's labor, whether it's product, whether it's raw material, that we're crossing borders. Um, however, at the same time as you're seeing trade expand from a commercial aspect, you're also seeing a growth in regulatory controls. Some of that is driven by protectionism so countries who used to use tariff barriers or taxes to try and stop outside countries getting their products in now use regulations because it's another way to make it difficult for a foreign company to move their products into that country. Um, but legitimately, there's also the need for controls because disease is spread with products. So uh, about five years ago, the U.S. introduced the red legislation around packing materials because what was happening is you had wood crates, and they were bringing product in on wood crates, but those wood crates had beetles that were wiping out uh, forests because of uh, invasion, invasive species. So there are valid reasons for regulations increasing, but there are also the commercial uh, protectionism. And the third thing that you're seeing very heavily happening is kind of fascinating because it was all started by the US uh, with NAFTA. So prior to NAFTA, the US has been pushing the World Trade Organizations to say, we should eliminate trade barriers, we should allow products to flow freely. And obviously, some countries were less willing to do that. And then when NAFTA was introduced, we really changed the rules of the game. Because we said, um, 
there are going to be duties, but conditionally, if you come from these related countries and you agree to the fact that the raw materials or the transformation occurs within those countries, then you don't have to pay taxes. And NAFTA was obviously Mexico, US, Canada. It was a brilliant move, and I think it's been a great boost. There's a lot of debate on it, but generally, trade agreements have been a great boost to economies. The problem is we then stopped. We didn't do any more agreements. But if you look at the map here, and look at the little China yellow dots, and all over the Middle East into Africa, other uh, economies have very quickly accelerated and started to strike up these agreements. So suddenly, global trade is like a game of chess where people are negotiating. And today, you can look at a single country, and it may be involved in three or four different trade agreements, even with the tra same trading partner. The reason that's important is suddenly you're impacting several percentage points on the cost of a product. Now, I don't know the things you cover in your syllabus, but a lot of the uh, focus on MRP and manufacturing processes, you're chasing a one percentage point, and yet here we are throwing away several percentage points on taxes that you could avoid if you leverage the right trade agreement. Um, I've done something wrong. Here we go. Am I pointing at the wrong thing? There we go. Um, so Yuri Dadosh is a, an economist who was looking at what should we expect to happen over the next 40 years or so. And as you can see, the first thing is you're going to see significant growth in populations in the third world versus the current uh, advanced economies. And by 2050, the actual third world will make up a much larger percentage of the middle class than we have today in Europe and the Western world. And therefore, by default, assuming they're the, the spending dollars, most of global trade is going to be occurring with those third world countries. And the, today, the reason the presentation says brick to play, are you all familiar with the term brick? Yeah, so the, the brick countries as the emerging economies won't be the emerging economies anymore because they will be advanced economies. And the expectation is there'll be a whole new set of economies that will be the ones that are growing. Um, and this study on populations is quite interesting, because if you look in 1950, the, of the top 12 countries, four of them are the major European countries. You get to uh, 2000, and now you're only looking at Germany, I'm, I'm talking population now, ranking in the top uh, 12. And, and anyone who's you know, read about Germany, they're having significant problems of a reducing population. So they're looking at how do we bring in more immigration, how do we encourage people to have more children. But they they're definitely already see they're going to drop out of the top 12. And look at countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, and there's not a single European economy. So the reason I share that is it's going to change the way business functions by default because of demand, because of spending dollars, and because of trading pairs. So the conclusions we can see happening in this whole third wave move, the first is that demassification and this uh, consumerism, what it's driving is smaller quantities and more frequent shipping. So take a cell phone as an example. You might have had large volumes of a single model of phone. I think Samsung launches something like six different models every year. Right? That's an indication of the kind of change you're seeing. Uh, the next thing is you're seeing the way trade occurs is shifting based on, obviously, political uh, challenges, but also economic challenges. So for example, during the fuel crisis, you started to see companies looking at Central South America more than China. Um, and you're seeing a regulatory environment partly driven by those same politics. Uh, so what's important when you're looking on behalf of your companies you're helping with um, the businesses you may be working for is you've got to look at being much more flexible than a lot of corporations are today. I hate to say it, but the rush to China by a lot of companies is more of a sheep mentality than an analysis mentality. So the early uh, visionaries of the large GEs of the world who actually did their homework did that based on really doing the analysis before they made those choices. Today, I see companies just assume China should be cheaper. 
China labor costs has increased, transportation costs have increased. There are a lot more choices that companies should be looking at than just assuming that move. Now, before I switch to the next stage, is there any questions on that first bit? Or are we good? Did, uh, is this like when I was sitting there that you're all thinking about where to go tonight? Yes, yeah, sorry. So, not that I'm selling this technology, but yeah, it's using technology to do the homework. So, a lot of people just either don't do the homework or they try to do it manually. And yeah, Integration Point is one example, but there are now more and more data sources that can tell you how to do these comparisons. And these, the, the users have typically been the five billion plus corporations historically. Now with the growth in trade in small organizations, I would say you use automation. So and when I mean automation, it's in both senses. It's actually to use the processing of paperwork, but it's also doing your analysis before you make those choices. You know, some of these companies will build a factory without fully understanding the implications years forward. A Levi's goes and does a study of every economy before they, they start to source clothing from a particular country and put their factories there. So that's what I was really meaning by that point. Um, so, so I was saying going from brick, and I just want to put it on record, especially if you're videoing me, this plastic is not a technical term, right? I invented plastic. I don't know if those countries are exactly the new emerging economies, but it's more to, to get across the principle that it's not going to be brick. It's already changing, right? So China is already suffering more competition from Vietnam, who wants to take on more of that manufacturing. That, that's really the point. Um, so, how many of you have come across the term landed cost? Anyone? Yeah. So, you know, again, it's another one of these things that uh, in life you, you never quite can figure out. I remember when Penn State asked me to teach this course, uh, I decided all th everything is in Google, right? Google is a source of all knowledge, and, and particularly Wikipedia is a uh, textbook. And so I thought, obviously, you'd find something about landed cost, and there was not even a formal definition. So this is an informal definition. The definition of landed cost, really, is all of the costs associated with landing a product from raw source to end customer by comparing it with domestically sourced. So the, the principle of landed cost was really when US companies were first looking at uh, sourcing from foreign suppliers, making sure when they were buying that product, were they paying the same or better than they would have paid if they bought from a domestically sourced product. That's really what landed cost is all about. And the more sophisticated corporations actually have this term, landed cost engineers. Their whole job is to make sure they are uh, calculating all of those charges into a transaction when they're making sourcing decisions or distribution decisions. Um, and this was a study about in 2007 by Deloitte Touche, and they went across, I think it was, uh, the next slide shows it, but I think it was like 800 or 1,000 manufacturers, uh, and really looked at what they saw happening. And being 2007, I can tell you it's gone faster than what this shows, but 50% were looking at sourcing from China, 40% were looking at selling into Central and Eastern Europe, and then the, the fact that they were all looking at launching more and more new products. Right? And I think that's gone up even faster. Um, but what they found when it was 800 companies here, what they found when they looked at these companies is most of them were doing these changes tactically. And what I mean by tactically is they were looking at a particular product line or a particular uh, lane segment rather than looking holistically about how did they do, do business globally. And what they found was only one in 10 actually took a global approach to it. And when they did, they actually improved their bottom line by 100%. Now, that's a huge impact in terms of the profit line. Um, so why, why, do they, why do people end up, end up being inefficient in what they thought was a good sourcing model? One of the things that, that often changes is currencies. 
So you've gone to a path and suddenly the economy is in trouble and it dramatically changes your conversion price. Then you have the taxes themselves. So as we've talked about, people not fully understanding tax impact and thinking that they can qualify for an agreement that they couldn't, uh, not taking account of trade agreements, not properly allocating transportation back. So something that, that I've experienced with large corporations is the transportation cost is captured more at a general ledger level rather than at a transactional level. So it's not always understood what a particular product costs to move. And then um, not taking account of extra costs that are incurred because of the sourcing. An example, when I was a CIO at LEP, I had to go and meet with Nike because we were late on a project and I was dreading that and the, um, the VP of uh, transportation in Asia was also there for problems he had. And his problems sounded a lot worse than mine, so I was kind of feeling glad he went first. And he had been told all the freight was soaking wet and all the boxes were crushed. So he said, Nike, remember when you told us you wanted to go the cheapest possible air uh, freight? And he said, yes. He said, well, that was through Colombo in Sri Lanka. And guess what? They don't have hangers. So when we have to take the boxes out, it's in the middle of a monsoon. It's impossible to avoid getting your freight wet. But OK, but what about the boxes being crushed? He says, well, remember you asked us to stack them up as high as you can to maximize the density. Will the boxes get crushed? So what they did was they had to, at the factories, uh, shrink wrap them, put them in, repack them into much stronger uh, packaging. But I guarantee you when the analysis was done, none of those costs were uh, accounted for when they did the, the uh, calculations. And having run a software company, you see a lot of business in practice. And, you know, I'll tell you this and you'll say, how can a big company be this foolish? And that's for, I'm not going to tell you their name. But um, this was a company who made uniforms, and they were making the uniforms, I'll say for who, it's for FedEx in Asia, and they were, guess what, making them in China. But they would bring all the uniforms from China to their North Carolina facility, check them in, and then they would go all the way back out to Hong Kong. Uh, and you say, well, how can you be making that kind of mistake? Well. What happens in large corporations is these processes are very defined and they're in very different parts of the business. So sourcing is on the procurement side of things and sales is on the sales side of things. And there's not enough of that analysis across products. The second one was a shoe manufacturer, same thing, going into South America through the US rather than direct. And, and, and sometimes there's good reason. So I don't want to just wave all scenarios out. but. These two were not necessarily good reasons. And the third one was a black box manufacturer. You know, you put in airplanes. Well, a smart sourcing executive decided he could replace a component from Mexico to China. What he didn't understand was it then disqualified them from NAFTA. So to save pennies, he gave up several dollars of uh, tax savings on the NAFTA program. So I just give those examples. Big companies, very smart but it's very easy to uh, make mistakes around trade. And what uh, Deloitte Touche said, if you do it right, then there are significant savings. And I'm not gonna say it's easy to do it right, but, but that was the overall message. I'm keeping an eye on time, so I can go on forever. Um, so what are the costs? And normally I would get the class to participate in this, but because of time, I would just go through some just to give you a sense. So the first thing is assist. A lot of people forget this, but uh, US manufacturers will often provide the equipment to the foreign uh, manufacturers to pay for all the machinery. Well, that's the cost that you have to calculate back in because customs requires it. Uh, it's a regulatory cost. There's obviously the transportation from the inland. So you're getting from the factory to the consolidation port before it goes on the ship or plane. You've got uh, hand port costs. So on the port itself, you're moving containers. And if you get delayed due to customs regulations, then you pay uh, demurrage. So there are charges all the way through. That's the thing a lot of people don't realize. There's a lot of costs involved in transportation globally. It, because of labor costs being so low, it still makes it worthwhile. But as labor cost changes, it's really important to fully understand that. 
Uh, there are, like in China, there's export processing fees. Um, I am not doing well with this. There we go. Um, certificate inspection. So have you ever heard the term letter of credit? So in, in, in the US, you, we just assume everybody has credit terms. But when you go international, there are no such thing as credit terms with a lot of these manufacturers. So banks uh, operate things like letters of credit as a way to secure the money. So basically, what you don't want to do is you pay this manufacturer in China to make all this product. It gets to the border, and then customs holds it. You've paid for it, and customs says, well, wait a minute. You know, it, this is using materials you're not allowed to bring into the country, or this has got the wrong paperwork. So the way that importers protect themselves is a letter of credit. And basically, a letter of credit says that you have to fulfill all of these correct pieces of documentation, one of which is an inspection. And if all those things are fulfilled, then we will release the money. That way, you know the goods are going to be able to clear because you've already essentially pre-cleared them in a foreign country. So those are costs that you have to take into account. There's obviously insurance, uh, the customs duties that you pay when you come into the country, as well as the brokerage fees that so you're paying a, somebody to file an entry with customs. Um, the inland transportation on the import side, so from the port or the airport to your warehouse or your end customer, um, any foreign exchange, any hedging, and probably the most important one is inventory carrying costs. Because when you're waiting essentially 15 days minimum on a ship, and if you're going through the Panama Canal and around maybe 25 days, then you're going to carry more inventory as buffer stock. right? So those should be calculated in when you do those costs. And you have all the risks associated with, with trade. So the greater the risk, the more you should be carrying stock. And as an example, if you're sourcing from Pakistan today, the government is more likely to inspect containers coming from Pakistan than from Singapore. So it's important as you're doing those estimates, you allow for the fact that, that there's likely to be in-transit delays as well. Um, and then fuel, as fuel prices fluctuate, it's really changing some of the patterns of uh, transportation. So this was really in 2009 when we had a sudden spike. There were 35% of uh, companies surveyed were actually going to near sourcing, so starting to move their uh, manufacturing out to Central America, South America. Um, they, they found uh, LCD TV manufacturers were actually moving things via ocean. So typically, high-tech products, because they have a, a very fast churn, tend to be uh, shipped by air. But because of the cost of fuel, you're seeing people go to. Uh, and the question about dual, uh, dual source strategy, you know, essentially, the danger when you go to a single source in another country is what happens if you have some kind of disaster. Okay? The, uh, I remember McDonald's during the avian bird flu outbreak they suddenly couldn't sell chicken nuggets because they were not in, in some of these Asian countries because they didn't have a source they could rely on. Uh, after that, they now have a dual source strategy where they have their prime source and then they have a backup source that if something were to happen that they don't control, then they have another way to get product. If you think about the earthquake in uh, Tokyo uh, or Japan, same thing. There were some companies who literally couldn't do business because they're so, so dependent on that source. And today, at being a global economy, I, I always question, is it that we have more disasters, or is it that because we're more global, every disaster becomes much more impactful to us? So it, to be a single source kind of operation when you're with your clients in your studies, you've really got to ask the question, can you afford to take that risk? Now, this is a, if many of you didn't know what landed cost is, I doubt if any of you know, are you familiar with INCO terms? Anyone come across the word? A, a few, good. So when you're doing these projects and you're comparing two sources of product, you have to make sure you're comparing the same price. And, and obviously, this sounds you know, like, duh, how would you ever be so stupid as to think that? You'd be amazed how many corporations don't really understand INCO terms. 
it tends to be more of a global uh, term, more than a US term. Americans totally abuse it, use it incorrectly. But it really is, if you think about a domestic business, it's really either the seller is paying transportation or the buyer, right? So they use the term prepaid or collect. There's only two people and there's only one set of freight and it's either the seller's paying for it, the buyer's paying for it. When you do international, it's dramatically different because even though there's still seller and buyer, there's different points at which you ch uh, transfer ownership and you pay for those, those charges. And in the old days, because they were loading ships without containers, so it was bulk freight, you know, it's hard to believe this, but there were gangplanks and people were loading bags and things onto ships, stuff would fall off the ship. And the argument became, well, who owned it when it went in the ocean? So they had to have a term to decide, did I buy it from you before it was on the ship, free on board, or um, alongside ship, FAS? So INCO terms are really defining that transfer and who is paying for what. And it really, they fall into three groups, which is the, what they call the F terms. So really, this is where the seller is paying for everything right up to loading on the ship or alongside ship. And what's happening with INCO terms, they used to all be about ships because most 90-something percent of ocean fre uh, of freight goes on the water. Uh, nowadays, the terms are trying to be more mode independent to allow you to handle. And then the second terms tends to be C terms, which is where the seller is paying not only up to the ship, but all the way to the foreign port. And I say ship, ship or plane. Paying for transportation, paying for insurance. So the real difference is, are you paying the insurance? Are you only paying the freight? And how far are you paying it up to? And then what's called D terms, which is where the seller is paying all the way to the end customer. So that's including the inland portion. It's including uh, duties and taxes. Um, and you can find this on the web. If you want to understand it in a simple form, there's a nice grid that breaks it out as to who's paying what. The reason it's important is if somebody says, well, I'm going to give you this price uh, FOB, that means it's this price and the inland transportation on the seller side, but no further. And somebody else is saying, I'm going to give you this price delivered, duty paid. They are not comparable. But you have to then figure out what that transportation cost is to be able to compare the two. A lot of American corporations say FOB everything. They say FOB your factory, FOB customs, and there's no such thing. And it's fine as long as the ship doesn't sink or the plane doesn't crash, because when that happens, you're in trouble. Because then when it goes to a lawsuit of who owned that, you're on very poor grounds if you haven't been using the right terms. Um, what's happened in trade is more and more it's become the buyer is controlling those terms and the transportation. So if you went back into the 80s, I'm, I'm, am I running over yet? I'll do like five or 10 more minutes, right? Um, if you went back in the 80s, what would have happened is if you were Walmart as a retailer, you would be buying everything uh, delivered duty paid. So you'd be saying to your suppliers, you deliver it to me at my uh, DC, and the manufacturer paid all the ocean transportation, the retailer would have uh, picked it up just at their DC, and they had to decide how they wanted it to delivered, what size container, 45 days out, because the actual packaging and all the decisions were made all the way out in the Chinese factory. In the 90s, what you started to see, whether it's a Nike or a uh, Wolverine shoes, or all of these brands started to be the ones, they would use factories, but they were the ones paying the transportation. And now they were trying to get more and more in the box to get more efficiency on their transport. And they were actually having it delivered to a consolidation center, so somewhere like a Hong Kong, and then moving it. Today, the Walmarts, the Targets, the JC Pennies, doesn't matter who it is, they're buying it at the Chinese factory or the Vietnamese factory 
they're actually managing the inland transportation from the factory to the port because they're really good at it and they've got volume. And what's happening is they're actually deciding how they're going to take it to their DC five to ten days out. And, and what I mean by that is they're not delivering it in the ocean container. What's happening is they're taking it at the port, they're bringing it to what are called uh, transload facilities. And if you saw one, it would be like across the size of this auditorium, 70 gates on one side, 70 gates on the other. And all they're doing is they're, un they're emptying the 40-foot uh, containers, repackaging it for their DCs, and then sending it out in 53-foot trailers. So they're actually then making that distribution decision. And why are they doing that? Fuel, because a 53-foot trailer weighs a lot less and can hold a lot more capacity. And then secondly, they're actually being smarter about how they're consolidating their shipments. So they're not uh, sending, Target won't allow a trailer to leave unless it's something like 85% full. Sorry, were you asking a question now? Okay. Um, so I was just going to give you a very quick example of how I'd take a $10,000 shipment of DVDs to show you what it can do on taxes. And I think uh, Anastasia has a better example, but this is Brazil, right? In the US, we just have one tax. By the way, we're the only country in the world that does not charge a sales tax at point of entry. If President Obama wanted to quickly uh, increase his revenues, that would be all he'd have to do, and he'd be doing what everybody else in the world does. We're the only country that doesn't do that. Um, every other country has taxes, and in the case of Brazil and Argentina, they have compound taxes. Uh, so the first tax is compounded and then et cetera. And in Argentina, they have seven of these layers of taxation. And so what ends up happening is you take that same shipment that was $10,000, and it's suddenly 20000 but actually it's 12000 with transportation, it's suddenly at a cost of $20,000. Right. So it makes things very expensive living in those countries to buy anything that's imported. And, but because of trade agreements like Mercosur, and I'll go through this quickly because of time, um, it, you get a reduction of another 30% or so, and then with Aladi, it's not quite as attractive, but it gives you more countries. It again reduces your taxation. But even if you use trade agreements, sometimes the, the basic cost of manufacturing is so low, then this is the example. This is actually T-shirts made in uh, Caribbean countries. Even if they were duty-free, they end up being more expensive than coming from China. I don't know if that would be true today anymore, because Chinese labor has gone up, but at the time that analysis was done. I, I again, can't share with you the companies, because people share this with me with a trust that I don't say who it is, but this is a um, kitchen furniture manufacturer. And the reason I show this is you assume all the time China's always cheaper, but on the, where it says import and make, the variance in brackets are, pl are actually products where it was cheaper in the US to make than it was in China. But they still decided they would give everything to China. And it was interesting their reasons. One of their reasons is a very valid one, which is you don't really want your cabinets to be slightly different color to your drawers, right? So I, I get that one as a, the dyes, could they, could they guarantee they were at the same color? But the second one was they were worried about the Chinese manufacturer going out of business if they took away some of their lines of product. So it, it's one that I guess if you're a US worker, you wouldn't feel that sympathetic about. But as a business person, you're always trying to find the best way to manage. Um, and I just share this because, and my friend here <laughs> shared this with me. So Jeff is, uh, handles trade for M&M Mars. But it's really to show you that the tariffs of these countries, and uh, Anastasia will get into more what tariffs are, but tariffs can be very complicated because they're interpreted by each country. So a chocolate crumb or a Snickers bar is not exactly the same when you go into these different countries. So um, really, conclusions are that you're not going to stop seeing a growth in sourcing and corporations trying to sell into other countries. Whatever people think, manufacturers not coming back to, into the US. You know, obviously, certain products might, but wholeheartedly, it's not going to happen. 
Um, it's nice to know your landed cost at the time you've paid it, but obviously there's not a lot you're going to do about it by that point. So the more you can plan and the more you can do the analysis, you're far better off. Um, there's no ideal tool, but at the minimum, at least, even if it's a spreadsheet, do some kind of breakdown. When you're doing your projects with companies and you're trying to find out if they're doing things smartly, start looking at some of these costs and build a spreadsheet looking at what those duties are because that's probably the thing that impacts most on the input side. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Anastasia. So Anastasia was sitting in your shoes less time ago than mine, but uh, she, she studied at uh, the Moore School, and she's joined Integration Point as part of something that my client and I set up, was to start hiring more graduates straight into the company and do an accelerated learning program. And she was one of those uh, hires. So. Yeah. To this because they found me to the podium today because um, I'm going to be using computer a lot more than Darren. He walks a lot. Um, I'd like to thank him because really, like you said, I've been in your shoes a couple years ago and right now I deal a lot with data, very, to some people, very boring stuff. I actually kind of derive pleasure from it, but it's really always nice to see how that data is applied. And that's what you guys are gonna be doing, right? You're gonna be doing these consult consulting projects and I'm here to help you understand the software that's gonna be available to you um, so that you can maximize that information they're providing you for free. Um, a lot of people pay a lot of money to look at this, this type of data, especially in that sort of form. But I think I would like to make it as useful to you and it was really nice to get to see how it is will be useful to you in the future. So hopefully, if you remember what he says and are able to use the software, it's gonna be a great uh, combination of the two. Um, um, let me get to my presentation. And can you hear me, is that, am I? Okay, good. Um, All right, so I'm gonna quickly talk a little bit about Integration Point and the type of project that we're doing with the schools um, around the US and actually internationally as well. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the type of content, the data that you are gonna be able to expect to see in our screens. Um, you know, if you have any questions about that type of data, I'm not quite sure how much you have covered in your program already. Um, feel free to ask me. And then I really want to jump into demo. And I know a few of you people, I really wanted to say this, um, have been, have signed a disclaimer, have, I got your emails. Um, and the process is, is that we're trying to get everybody to sign up, uh, or as many of you as possible, just to kind of scale it. And then I will send uh, login information to your professor and it will be distributed to you. So don't worry, I got quite a few emails. Um, you guys, wh whoever did hit, hit that submit button, um, and I will also, for those of you who haven't yet, I will show really quickly how to get there and how to get me the email saying that you sign a disclaimer and get yourself login instructions. All right, so integration point. We've been around for about eight, um, 11 years, 11, 12, almost 12 now. Um, and we manage, um, it's actually, when I started working for them, I didn't know much about the company. Um, and um, when I started looking into it, I realized how how widespread it is through various industries. We um, manage about, or help manage about 400 billion worth of trade. Uh, we work or facilitate trade for our clients um, around the world, and this is this has 100 plus. Um, you know, we constantly getting asked for information, data, and compliance information for new countries. So I, there's no way for me to actually tell you the exact number of countries that we help manage trade. Um, for, um, uh, we also maintain, and this is my part, this is what I get really excited about, we maintain data for over 150 countries, um, and again, constantly trying to get more um, data, and I'll show you how it's pertinent to what you will be doing. And we work with uh, multiple, multiple industries, from automotive and petroleum to retail, um, to even um, space industry, so. 
it always amazes me of, of how far reaching it is because it is so useful. Um, we, have, um, we have offices around the world as well, being a global um, trade compliance company. We realize that we need to have expertise, we need to have people who are familiar with the different um, customs, regulations, with different, um, have different contexts throughout the customs or other government organizations as well. So we're slowly growing. Uh, with, we started sort of, actually, yeah, we, our, headquarters is in, our headquarters is in Charlotte, and then we've grown out um, with NAFTA and working a lot with uh, duty deferral. We worked um, out into the Americas having offices in Mexico, and then also realizing that we're missing all this. Uh, we opened offices in India and uh, Georgia, and then slowly grew into Europe, and now Africa and Australia, and uh, China and Brazil as well. This project um, is actually fairly new. We're still learning. I will send you guys a little um, survey at the end of your experience. Hopefully you can give me some tips on how to improve um, our services to you. But we have worked with Penn State through Darren, and I'm, I, as a graduate of University of South Carolina, have approached some of the professors there, and they all found that it would be useful for the students to have access to this information. Some of this data is used um, in purely hypothetical projects, uh, but a lot of it is similar to what you guys are gonna be doing. It's a consulting project. Um, a lot of times it is a company that's specifically looking into expanding, exp uh, exp um, Im importing, you know, sourcing from other countries, exporting. Uh, we partner a little bit with uh, US Commercial Service and they're very interested in exports out of the US. So projects such as this, helping educate your clients now um, on the best ways, the most efficient ways of importing or exporting their products. And so now we have Georgetown. Um, and the other idea is that this is, on one hand, we are always looking for bright um, individuals to, uh, to join us. So we've grown exponentially in the last 11 years and constantly, like I showed you the map, you know, looking in the U.S., but also other countries. And um, so it could be you, right, if you wish to get more into um, compliance and supply chain. Or, you know, after we really want you guys to have a very good experience with our software, I will provide your professors with um, information how to contact me. We really want you to then go out and talk to the people that, you know, the people that you work with, you know, consulting projects, and then in the future when you are out there working and all of a sudden you run into some problem with, you know, international trade with your company, uh, your future employer, and you go, oh, wait, I use this international uh, integration point uh, software. Maybe that's something that we could use in our, um, in this new company, in your, for your employer. So, um, so that's our interest. Now the type of content that you guys are, um, can expect to see here, and also you might say, well, you know, there's Google, like Darren said, I can always Google it all, right? How many of you, let me see if, uh, hands, how many of you have seen tariff schedules before? Okay. Um, how many of you have seen more than US tariff schedule before? Okay, a little fewer, all right. Um, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I deal with this every day, and depending on the country, it's quite hard to find sometimes all this information. So, in our system, you're gonna be able to find information for denied party screening. Um, are you guys familiar with denied party screening? Yes, no, okay. Uh, so, it's either country, company, or people that you should be aware um, you should not be doing business with, basically. So you need, to, you need to screen against them. You need to deny your business when you're doing with them. And I'll show you really quickly in the system what, you know, how you can screen against a certain name and it will tell you, okay, such and such person is a terrorist. You really should not be, you know, sending them your cell phones. <laughs> um, and this is just one example. In J Japan, this is the website that you would find it in. Export controls. Export controls is, you know, Darren talked about bringing your products in, but there's also such thing as bringing, taking products out and letting the government know that you're taking a certain product out. 
I just said cell phones, you know, so it seems like a relatively innocent product, right? Why not? But um, most governments would like to know where you're sending those um, cell phones to because you have a GPS tra a tracker in there. And the GPS tracker can be extracted and put into a missile launcher and, you know, you know then targeting us. So uh, this, is, this is kind of an extreme situation, but there are military lists and there are dual use lists. Like cell phone is a dual use, right? Obviously it's got a very peaceful use of you calling your friends or your mom on the weekend, or it could be used for that GPS tracker. So that's information you can find on our screens as well. Um, the other purpose for, of this uh, slide was also to kind of show you that there are all sorts of different ways of finding this information. Before you saw a website, uh, Canada export information comes in a book or PDF form. Um, some of these come in, you know, searchable format. Um, you can download the PDF or you actually have to pay for the book from a uh, uh, for some customs. So we make it easy, hopefully, that, that's, that's the point. Uh, tariff schedules, um, we also, this is a Brazilian tariff schedule. It's, this website is all in Portuguese, right? And it's really hard to find this information in English, actually up to date. And that is also very important because some of this information changes very, very frequently. Like, I think EU changes every week sometimes. So we uh, have a large team of people and experts that actually are in charge of certain countries and they make sure that they maintain information that you're gonna be looking at up to date and accurate. Um, are you guys familiar with uh, customs rulings? No? Okay. Um, so this is, this is for you and I'll show you in a little bit in the, in the system but um, for classifying products. So you know, Darren, I really appreciate him showing that slide with the different HS numbers and how you know you can see it's break, broken up by chapter, heading, subheading, and then the final qualifying number that you actually declare to customs. Um, anybody has used any of the, like um, export.gov maybe to classify a product before for a class? No, show of hands? No, okay. So for example, I have this clicker, right? And I need to, export it out of the US and bring it into Great Britain, right? I have to assign a number to it, and I'll show you the, the numbers with the descriptions, but um, sometimes you really wanna be certain that this number, or this clicker is classified a certain number because the penalties for misclassifying it are quite strict. It's uh, definitely some time in jail and um, some fines. So some uh, governments are really nice, and they allow companies to provide them with a description, sometimes an example, a sample of the product, and they will consider that and they will tell that company, this is your HS number, this is the HS number you should be using when you're um, importing and exporting your product into our country, right? And that, so that varies from country to country. Like if the US classified this as 850617, it could be 16 or something else. Argentina is actually notorious for really large, large numbers. So some of these fully qualified numbers might be 10 digits, some of them could be up to 14 digits. So that's another place to find some of this information that you will find useful in the future. Um, free trade agreements, rules of origin, Darren, I think, covered that very thoroughly about making sure that your products, you're taking advantage of the lower duty rate. Um, Anti-dumping is additional duty on top of the duty, and this is a Chinese website, which is all in Chinese. In our, in our site, you'll find it in Chinese and English. Uh, quotas, it's another thing to look out for. Um, are you, there's quotas, there are just basic quotas where you, know, you can only bring so much of a certain product into a country. Um, and then also preferential, like you can only use a preferential treaty um, until the quota is fulfilled and then you have to use a regular duty rate. And this is a US site. Um, other charges, oh, again, Darren talked about that at length, about how you can have additional charges on top of your duty rates. And then um, controls, also something to look out for. Sometimes a country will for no reason say, hey, I don't want you to bring fish with prickly fins into my country. So that's, and that is published by a separate entity sometimes. Sometimes it is customs, sometimes it is an other government organization. So we go through and we track that information we put in our system. That's something that you would have to go out and look for on your own. And this is a site in Russian. 
So if, unless you know a lot of you speak Russian, it would be very difficult to get this information in English. All right, so we combine it all in a global trade pot, like this, this the piece I was talking about is over here. And then um, the other part of what a company does is supply chain management for our clients and due to deferral, like FTZs and um, IMAX and things like that. So to quickly visually demonstrate what Darren was talking about, about duty rates and then using free trade agreements. So if you go here, we're importing um, a product. I actually don't have a product here, but we're importing a product from the U.S. into these six countries, right? And it looks like here with the duty rate of 6%, Chile might be the place to go to, right? You're trying to um, research a new market for your client. You're seeing, you know, how much you're going to have to be paying to penetrate the market just to bring in their product. And then you actually look at the preferential duty rates. Now here it looks like Mexico because of NAFTA, um, South Korea, and Chile might be a good, um, good places for you to go into instead of just, uh, just Chile or maybe you know, consider Mexico's closer. You won't have to spend as much um, on the transportation. So the next thing to look at is the additional other charges. So if you consider that, and Darren, I think, was very clear about the amount of additional um, costs that you can incur in Brazil. Right? Obviously, that does, not, that does not look good at all. But here, you can see that Chile was free. If you could, um, if you could apply for the, tr for the free duty rate, you would have 0%, but then you would have to pay additional 19%. So now South Korea is looking. And that, that's just a small example for you to think about when you, and, and what Darren was talking about with the, you know, that 1% margin rate, right, that you're trying to chase. And that's the, that's the difference, just these three slides of doing research, doing, being very careful. And so hopefully now I can answer the question that was asked earlier, well, how do I do that? Um, you guys have the benefit of using the system. So quickly, uh, for those of you who have not signed up yet, all you do is you click on sign up. You read this very lengthy um, text, but basically it's telling you, I, I do suggest you read it, but, uh, <laughs> but it's basically telling you that, you know, don't share this information, don't copy it, don't do screenshots of it and show it to other people. Uh, don't share your login, because some of you who haven't signed it will not get a login. And I hope everybody does, because I think it's a very useful tool. Um, and then um, whenever you do presentations to clients, please reference us. We would like for them to know where you got your data so that if they ever need it again, they, can, they know where they could look. Um, you click accept, or sorry, you fill out information here. Um, give me as many names as possible. Some of you have some complicated names. So I have to match up and make sure that um, I have you on the list. And then the course number, everybody's in the same course. Um, you could read this in Spanish if you were in our University of Mexico. And then um, accept it, click submit, and I'll get an email. And then I'll, I'll, give you, I'll get you a login, I promise. Um, so I already have a login. And so when you log in, this is basically what you're going to see. Um, that's the denied party screening information I was telling you about earlier. This is content. Um, this is all the uh, regulatory data uh, that's related to import, so harmonized schedules, and also export right here. And I'll quickly go over the different screens that you will encounter. Um, so really quickly, earlier I, ta I told you about the Harmonize uh, system, right? Basically assigning numbers to different products. So WCO made our life a little easier. What they did is they said up to a certain digits, we're going to make everybody have the same number for the same probe. Uh, so this mouse, going back to this mouse, right? It needs to belong to a certain chapter, a certain subchapter heading, and then a certain subheading within that, within that chapter, which is kind of cool, right? Um, because otherwise, countries could have said, well, I think this is chapter 15, and the other one could have said, this is chapter 85, and then there would have been much more confusion than there is now. But uh, aside from that, WCO, if you select it here, is not, um, isn't going to give you all the informa regulatory information that you want to 
look up because WCO kind of speaks for all the countries. So to actually find the information for a specific country, and I will be looking into importing into the U.S. for a minute, um, I would select the U.S. import-export tariff. So I'm bringing a product into the U.S. and I need to classify it with the U.S. Um, HTS, U.S. likes to be different. You hear HS numbers everywhere else in the world, which is harmonized schedule. U.S. would be HTS, which is harmonized tariff schedule. Um, and then those of you who I think said, somebody did say they might have classified some products, right? Um, this is, if you have no idea what your product is, right? Uh, what this number is, what, what are these chapters or headings or subheadings that I'm talking about, all you have to do in our system is just type in a word and click search. You bring your jacket into, you, uh, you know, a container of jackets into the U.S., you want to know what is this HS number that you have to follow. Now, sometimes that word might not be in the descriptions, so if you put in a, num a word there and nothing comes up, um, try to think more broadly. Like instead of jackets, think apparel. Or, you know, I, I, think, I think before I looked up for tents, I looked up sporting equipment or something like that. So you look it up. You also, I suggest always using this, um, this form right here, because if it's, sometimes it will, it, the system will be very um, strict about having just jacket or jackets or some sort of a variation of the word, this would help you kind of broaden your search. You can also broaden your search by looking through the description of binding rulings right here. Um, but that will bring up a lot, a lot of uh, different results. So if you're having a really hard time, I recommend looking at the binding rulings as well. I'm not going to go there right now. And what the system is telling me is the word jacket appears in chapter 62 and appears there two times. And then I can kind of narrow my search down and I can find out exactly where that word appears within that chapter, right? So that is a way to classify. Does anybody have questions about helping you classify your product? Okay. Um, the other thing too is whenever you're looking at multiple countries, I always recommend looking at US personally um, and then using that, that first uh, six digits and then looking in other countries. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll switch up to Mexico in a minute. But, so this is for you to search if you have no idea what, what your HS number is, right? If your client comes to you and says, I need you to look at my processes of importing jackets into the US, but I have no idea what my HS number is, this is where you would look. You can also look through these chapters, they actually have names in them, right? So, I'm, I'm sorry, it's really, can people see back there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, um, I don't know if there's a way to get, make it any bigger. Well, all right, take my word for it, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so all of these, so you go 01, 02, 03, 04, going all the way down to 90s, and they're different chapters, and they have different descriptions, like this was chapter 01 and it says live animals, and then it goes meat, and edible uh, meats. Okay, so the first part of the tariff is usually has to do with natural products. Then you get into chemicals, then you get into um, more of the um, man-made manufacturing things, and then you kind of have um, oddball uh, products, maybe some, I think there's, There's musical instruments, there's some antiqui um, antiques, toys, things like that at the bottom over here. But for you to know, basically, scroll through this. If, if you have a product, identify the chapter you think your product should be in. And then once you identify a product or the chapter, then in this system you can go through and you can actually click on this little, there's a little plus next to the bar, and it will give you more detailed information. Then you have to choose something else. And you have to choose your heading. And once you choose your heading, you can actually, you get directed to the, the description of your product. I'm looking for, so what I looked at, I think, let, let's see. 
I looked at articles of apparel. I looked at women's and girls' suits, ensembles, jackets, blazers. I'm looking for a dress, actually, right now. So that's what I'm narrowing it down to that. I found my dresses, and these are girls' dresses. And I'm looking for a dress made of synthetic fibers. Right here. So sometimes it gets very, very precise. Like this one says, containing 23% or more by weight of wool of fine animal hair. Now you might not have that information, especially in a consulting project. So that is, so that is a place to narrow it down to the last few numbers and then asking your client to make that decision for you. Because this is actually a legally, um, there's a legal repercussions for not selecting the correct HS number. Um, so once you actually find it, and I really hope you can see the next screen because that's more important than this. Okay, once you select that number, that file number, this is the screen that you're gonna see and it's gonna provide you with this. If you can't see, I'm really sorry, but I think just understanding where things are hopefully will help you in the future. Um, you have general information about that number, and the one good thing is if you forgot how, to, how you got there while you were classifying, you can click up there on top, it says full description, and it will give you that whole description from the chapter to heading to subheading, and you can double check. Um, you can find some information about when this uh, HS was effective, if it's expiring anytime soon, if it's actually associated with any of the export control numbers. So this being addressed, it's not really um, any sort of a dual use object, but if it was a cell phone, it could have a ECN number that's associated with it. And then you would need to make sure that there's no uh, certificates that you need to um, file with the government to let them know that you're exporting this product once. You, now you're bringing it in, but if you're taking it out, then you're gonna need some uh, licenses and, and, um, and certificates for that. You have, in this tab, you'll see quota information. I don't know if that would be that, if that's too detailed information for your project, but that's where you'd find that. And also any other HS numbers that have been previously associated with this number. This is very broad information. This is something for you to just look through if you have the time or interested. Um, I think the next tab is much more important for you. And that's where you will find the, the main duty rate and then the preferential duty rates, right? So this being, a U, this being US, you have column one, column two. Column one is referring to the duty that the, every country aside from Cuba and North Korea have to pay coming to the US with their product. And then column two is what a product coming from Pu Cuba or North Korea. That's, that's the duty rate that would need to be paid for it. Um, wherever you see the different colored <laughs> numbers or text within the tables, you can click on that information and it will provide you with additional detail. So, for example, here, when I click on the, on the rate for uh, column one going into the US, it brings up information telling me that this, this duty rate applies to all countries except for Cuba and North Korea. Um, and then if there are any notes or any, any questions that you have, sometimes there's text instead of rate that says, you know, see note or something like that, this is where you would see that note. Uh, if there were future rates, future rates is uh, the rates that sometimes, especially for preferential duty agreements, the countries will say, okay, uh, we don't wanna lower our duty rate immediately, we'll just lower it gradually. So, you know, between US and Colombia, for example, they'll say, uh, bringing sugar from Colombia into US, this year is gonna be 5%, next year is gonna be 2%, the year after that is gonna be 0%. We don't wanna just say 0% right away because we don't wanna fl flood our market with Colombian sugar. Um, so they will, um, that data would appear in this tab right here where it says duty, uh, future rates, right here. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then really quickly also, to narrow down your information um, over here, you would select the country. Uh, 
And that way it will only show you, because that was a pretty long list there. Um, you can actually select a specific country you're importing from into the US, and it will show you the duty rate here. And if you click on it, it will show you information about um, uh, rule of origin, which is very important. You need to make sure that you actually can um, apply for this preferential duty rate and any additional information over here, including contacts uh, to, the, to people who are uh, managing that um, preferential duty rate. All right, next one is other charges. That kind of goes hand in hand with what I was, I was showing you, the graphs. So that was duty rate. Remember I showed you how main duty rate, um, Chile was the best place to uh, penetrate the market. Then we looked at the preferential duty rates. We have three countries. Uh, that look very um, attractive. And then now we're looking here and there's other charges. As Darren mentioned, there's no VAT, that the US is the only country that doesn't have VAT, but they actually do have other charges. They have uh, other taxes that could be charged um, upon entry into the US. So unfortunately, some, some of these countries don't actually, some of this information is managed by um, entities other than customs, so they don't associate their information with specific HS numbers. And that's where we provide you with a list of different descriptions instead of HS numbers, and you can search through those descriptions in here. And for example, if I wanted to double check and see if I needed to pay extra taxes when bringing wine into the US, um, it would narrow down my searches. Over here, um, so technical. Oh, sorry, I don't not familiar with this computer. Um, it would here you would look, put in your product and see if it brings up a, a different charge. Um, we've, I mentioned controls before. That's the next tab over here. Oops. So check and see if there's any sort of control license that you need to comply with. Rulings that that basically helps you with classification. Going back to that, so I don't know if that actually would be something you would be interested in. No, it's something that's included in a tariff. That's a, again, it's not typically from what I found the, um, in the university. That's not something that you would be reviewing. Commercial documents are actually an interesting tab. This gives you an idea of how many documents um, you have to fill out and gives you samples of those documents where available. So. It gives you an idea maybe how much you're gonna to have to pay for some certificates or licenses. So that's a, actually a very useful um, tool as well. There are different ways of finding this information. Whenever you find a fully qualified number in a different color within the system, you can click on it and it should bring up that, that um, screen. And I think with, um, For your uses, there's another screen that I really like. It kind of shows you what a tariff schedule typically looks like. So, it's the same information. You're going to get the same information. It's just a different way of searching for it. Yeah. Just quickly show the tariff analyzer so you see how it's used. Okay. okay. Um, just one second. Okay. I swear. So here you basically, you can either put in chapters, heading, subheading, it will, I want to narrow down my search, so I'm actually just going to look at the subheading and down. Um, I'm going to select both descriptions, you, and then here you can select main duty rate. This, this one I like is because it compares the multiple numbers across multiple um, duty rates at the same time. So I narrowed down my search a lot, but um, here you can see that you would be able to see the, the rate for main duty rate and all the preferential duty rates in the same line. And if you had a, a multiple um, numbers coming off here, you could actually see if from synthetic dresses to cotton made dresses, the duty rate would change. So that's something that somebody would need to keep in mind as well. Um, Darren really wants me to show you a tariff analyzer, which is also a great tool. Also, to allow questions on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, really quickly. No. So, this, this tool helps you with comparing. 
And we're going to go from, you got to, again, I'm, I'm hoping, this says destination country and country of origin. So my destination country, I'm going to be bringing products into Mexico. And I'm going to bring, I'm going to be analyzing whether I want to source my products from Colombia, Brazil, or Chile. Sorry. Just pick it. I'm used to just typing in abbreviations. Okay, and I'm going to be bringing in chocolate into Mexico from these countries. All right, what happens here is actually helps you, sh it helps you see the, um, oh my. you can also select multiple countries except just Mexico. Maybe you're going into Mexico or U.S. or another country. And then you put in the number, you select the number down here that you think fits your description best, the product best. And then when you click search, it brings up this chart. And you can go across and you can see that Colombia, uh, go, basically, if whenever you hover over the text, it also gives you additional information. Yeah. You can see that this is the this yeah. is main duty rate that you. So have they to will pay. have to leave. Okay. So All right. Just, Sorry. Go ahead. Anybody it's just, have questions? It's a, it's a tool that allows uh, corporations to look at comparisons when they're doing that analysis. What's the best place to source from? So when you're doing your projects, if you're in that kind of avenue where you're trying to find out what's the smartest way to do something, it can be a really effective tool. Uh, any questions? Hmm. Quickly, I apologize. I know you guys. Have your other classes you have to go to. I know many of you have projects that are dealing with the market penetration. As you know, this is really tedious and very a lot of detail. But you can imagine the amount of information. At some point in any business, somebody has to go through all this pain. I mean, getting to the comparison of uh, am I getting wool of this or that? I mean, even this is my field, and I'm like, you have to be kidding me. You know, I was like, are you serious? This is just a paid punishment. But in any event. The bottom line, and that is where hopefully you will appreciate the value added of this, is that companies need to go through this because at the end they are not moving money, they are moving products. And those of you that are in the process of projects dealing with market penetration, the tool will allow you to do a fair comparison. If I bring it from here for there. So, you know, just uh, it took a little bit longer than we expected. Thank you so much. Let's uh, join me in thanking them for the effort.